Well, welcome to another Friday night. We've been doing a deeper look at the 60 characteristics of complex trauma, the things that people did in order to survive while they were in an environment of fear, and those things now in adult life are causing them problems. They maybe kept them safe and let them survive, but today they're destroying relationships and their own personal life. And so today we come to the fear of change, which is a very significant one for people from complex trauma. You may not know, but the fear of change or changing things is called metathesiophobia. It's a nice big word for you. And it's often linked with tropophobia, which is the fear of moving. Under, to understand that in the context of complex trauma is complex trauma the child or the person is getting hurt and it's, they can't stop it, they can't resolve it. And so one of the great fears that comes out of complex trauma is the fear of getting hurt. And so that's why change is something that also causes fear because every time there's a change, there might be something new that you didn't anticipate was going to be in this change where you might get hurt. And so change triggers fear for most people from complex trauma because there's the possibility of getting hurt. The problem is in our world today that life equals change. Change is part of life. And for many people with complex trauma, that just creates trigger after trigger after trigger. Now I want you to think about this with me just a little bit. And so we're going to start with this. Whenever there is a change, it causes stress. It activates our stress response system. Because a change means a new environment. A change means my brain now has to become familiar with the, that environment. It has to check out if the people in that environment are safe, if the environment is safe. It has to begin to sort and catalog all the different pieces of that environment so that it knows what to expect. And then I may have to learn new skills in order to handle this environment. I may, may need to meet new people and develop new relationships. So moving to a new environment or change causes stress on our system. Our brain has a lot of work to do to sort out, to get into a routine, to figure out if it's a safe. It has to do all of that before it can relax. So I think you can see that any change then is a stressful thing. It activates the stress system in our body. So let me just give you an example of just a mild little change and have you think about how it affected you. So imagine that you are going to your friend's place and they've asked you to stay overnight. So you're sleeping in their house in a strange bed. There's other people in the house. So for a lot of people, that little change of sleeping in a different bed, in a different house, in a different location would mean they didn't, won't sleep very well that night. Maybe even the second night. And that shows that the stress system has been activated. Just by being in your friend's house, sleeping in a different bed, you can't relax. Part of your system is now on guard. Let's say that you go to an airport and you have to go to the washroom or a sporting event and you have to go to a washroom and there's all kinds of people in the bathroom and all of a sudden you get a shy bladder. You can't void your, your bladder. That's because your stress system has been activated by that change of how you go to the washroom and, and so you can't do it. Or let's go back to you've gone to your friend's house so you're, you're on a work convention thing away from town so you don't sleep the first night very well but also you're not able to have a bowel movement because your stress system has been activated. You can't fully relax. And then for some people, just that little bit of a change, they can find themselves biting their nails again, picking at their fingers again, going back to old kind of self-soothing type habits that happens when they're nervous or have anxiety. 
For some, they might feel their asthma get triggered. If slight stress can cause their breathing to trigger their asthma. And so what I want you to see is if you come from complex trauma, even little changes that most people would say are no big deal, that are safe, you can't quite relax totally. Everything in your stress system is activated and it affects how your body functions. You're on guard. That's what change can do. Now let me give you a couple other types of changes and just think about how it affected you. Think back to bodily sensations, emotions that you felt. So, let's say you just turned 50. You've had a birthday. That is a, a change. You're now in the 50 club. How did that affect you? What other emotions did it create? Did it send you into any negative thinking? Did it send you into acting in, in ways that might be unhealthy? Just that change can affect people. Or let's say your child gets married. It, it's a good change, but how did that affect you? Or, or let's say your child moves away from home. You, they've left the nest. How did that change even in your daily routine and having them around the house and feeling important in their life as, as being there to care and provide for them? Now that's changed. How did that change affect you? Or let's say that one of your parents becomes very sick or they die. How did that loss, that change affect you? And so for many people, those changes affect them, even if they're healthy. But for people with complex trauma, it can trigger a whole lot of things that we're going to look at in just a minute. How about COVID? All of a sudden, there's fear of catching COVID. All of a sudden, there's restrictions, so you can't go out and connect with friends. Lots of changes, fairly significant changes. How has that affected your mental health? How has that affected your emotional world? Has it led to going back to bad habits? Change has a profound effect. What can happen for many people as they start to work on themselves and get into recovery is they start challenging some of the beliefs that they were taught as a child, either in their home, in their church, in their culture, and now as they begin to challenge old, old beliefs, they're going through changes. They're changing how they think about things, how they see things. How do, did those changes affect you? What did it trigger inside of you? Or you're in recovery from addiction or trauma. You're changing your lifestyle. You're changing how you cope. You're changing your friends. Lots of changes are involved in getting healthy when you come out of addiction or trauma. For many people, that change triggers lots of things in others. They now oppose you. They don't like your changes. Or you go through times of self-doubt. Am I doing the right thing? Times of confusion. It triggers all kinds of different things. So I hope that helps you see that change for people from complex trauma causes a lot of fear. Now, let me take it back to childhood. And let me build towards understanding this even greater. <clears throat> so in a healthy child's development, there's several key components that are necessary for a child to develop in a healthy way. The first is the child has to be safe. So they need a safe environment. They need safe people around them. And that means that their main caregivers regulate their own emotions, that they are lo unconditional love, that they accept the child, that they meet the child's needs with love, that there's consistency in the child's life. There's a routine. There's structure. Life is predictable for them. And so what they're finding about infancy and early child development is the child needs 
little, very little change is important. They need consistency. That helps their brain begin to develop properly. And then what happens as part of that is the child has no capacity to handle stress. And so in a healthy environment, what parents do is they introduce new challenges to the child at a time that is appropriate to their age, and they give, they teach the child the tools necessary to handle that challenge. So think of tying their shoes, riding a bike, learning to read, arithmetic, learning to add and subtract. All of those things are gradually introduced in manageable doses at age-appropriate times. And what happens when a child is confronted with this new area of challenge? They go through stress. I'm, I got to tie my shoes. I got to ride my bike. But you're teaching them. You're supporting them. You're helping them. And they apply the tools and they manage that new skill. The stress goes away and they grow in some confidence, they grow in ability, all of that becomes important. Now that problem no longer causes them, causes them stress. And so you introduce the next challenge and the next challenge, and they grow, and they grow in their ability to handle life's problems without getting stressed out. It's manageable, it's controllable, it's age-appropriate. And so what happens with the child, it's like a muscle where you go to the gym and you add weight to that muscle, you stress that muscle out, but you make it manageable. And so the, the muscle is able to do it and it grows. It grows in capacity. It grows in strength. And so the same thing is happening with the child is you're gradually helping them to grow in strength, in ability, in capacity, so that they can handle more and more things without getting stressed out. And so they gain confidence. And then if they fail, they can get back up because there's a resilience there now that says, I can learn how to do this. I have support. So that is healthy child development. Meeting the needs, but introducing new challenges that are stressful but are manageable so that the child keeps growing. So let's bring in complex trauma. So let me just say this up front. Many people, when they think of complex trauma, they think about <clears throat> what was done to you, abuse. You were mistreated, you were hurt. It is just as important to understand that complex trauma also includes what didn't happen to you. Areas of neglect needs that weren't met, the ways in which you weren't loved the way you should be, that is also an environment that produces complex trauma. And so I want you to think with me about this neglect piece in a child, okay? So again, the bottom line is how we are loved shapes us. How we are loved also shapes our brain and it shapes the main regulatory systems in our body. So if we're loved well, they become healthy. If we're not loved well, our regulatory systems don't develop properly and we have trouble regulating ourselves. And so again, change, how we respond to change depends on how we were loved. If we were loved well, change is okay because we know we have tools and support and we will learn and manage it and it will be controllable. If we weren't loved well, change can be very scary. So let me talk about three types of neglect. The first is chaotic neglect. Growing up with parents in an environment that is patternless. It's chaotic. It's fragmented. You don't see the pattern. So let me give you an example. Let's say a child grows up in a home where some days when they cry, somebody comes and, and picks them up and meets their needs and comforts them. 
so they get a very good response. But other days they cry and nobody comes. So they get no response. But then other days when they cry, somebody comes, but when they come, they're angry. They yell at the child. They hit the child. They might even shake the child in frustration. So what the child learns is there's no pattern for what to expect if you have a need and cry. It could be a good result. It could be a bad result. It could be zero result, but is, which is also a bad result. And so there's no pattern for the child. Life is now unpredictable. And the brain does not like to live in an environment where stress is unpredictable. Things happen that are potentially hurtful that are unpredictable. And so the stress system in that baby starts to be active all the time. It always has to be on guard because it doesn't know what to expect on any given day when it has a need. Life is chaotic. But then you have dismissive neglect. And so that would be where mom or dad are physically present in the room, but they're not present emotionally. They're not there for you. They're not connecting with you. They're not interested in connecting with you. They have something more important than you that they are connecting with the TV, their phone, their friend. And so that causes trauma because the message the child gets is you're not worth connecting with. You're not valuable or lovable enough for me to want to connect with you. Now they've done studies where parents have purposely disconnected from the child. They've gone and got occupied with their phone or distracted with a friend. And so they've watched what happens with the child. And within seconds of the caregiver not engaging with the child, the child is aware of it. Because something in their radar wants to feel connection all the time in order to feel safe. So they feel when that connection is broken and they immediately become distressed. Because now they feel alone. And so they may cry, they may call out, they may touch the parent trying to get their attention. But if the parent still does not respond and engage the child again, the child then can't resolve the problem. They're trying everything, but nothing's working. So the child begins to shut down. They emotionally withdraw, disengage, and go into themselves. So that dismissive neglect is what many of you have experienced. And that creates trauma because nobody is there for you. You feel alone against all of the problems of the world. You feel without support and without tools to handle it. There's a third type of neglect. Call it splinter neglect. And it means that A parent is very good at meeting some of the needs of a child, but not good at meeting others. So for example, you might have had a parent who met your physical needs so well. You had great food, clothing, safe housing, good neighborhood. You were involved in all kinds of athletics and extracurricular activities. Your physical needs were met, but they didn't meet your emotional needs. Or you might have a parent that was very good in meeting your fun needs and your happiness needs, lots of excitement, lots of fun things. They were just terrible at knowing how to respond to you when you were sad or afraid. So great at meeting one need, but not others. So you feel very much connected in this area, but you feel disconnected, neglected in this other area. That also causes trauma. All of those things, I hope you realize, every type of of neglect causes the stress system to be activated. Because all of a sudden it is, what do I do about this? Nobody's there for me. Life is unpredictable. So let me apply that then to patterns of stress. So what we saw in a healthy home 
is that the stress was the right amount for the age of the child. What happens in complex trauma? The stress is extreme. It is way more than the child can handle. They do not have the skill set to do it. In a healthy home, it's predictable. In complex trauma, it's unpredictable. You don't know when something's going to happen. You can't predict it. In, com in, in healthy home, it's short term. It's a problem, but you're given tools, and so you manage it, you resolve it, the stress goes away. In complex trauma, you can't resolve it. So it becomes prolonged stress. So complex trauma leads to extreme stress, unpredictable stress, prolonged stress, all of which keep the stress system activated. You can't relax. You have to be on guard. It keeps cortisol happening in your brain. All of that is not healthy for the development of a child. All of that prevents all the, the systems in the body from developing in a healthy way. The immune system, the, the central nervous system, the brain, all of those different things are affected by the stress system being constantly activated. So let's say this child who comes out of complex trauma now is you as an adult. And you are going through a change. How is it going to affect you? What characteristics of the fear of change can we expect to see in your life? So let me start by saying this. I find that people who have a fear of change coming out of complex trauma tend to go on one of two extremes. So the first extreme is they hate change, but the problem is they grew up with that chaotic neglect. They grew up with an unpredictable, chaotic life. And so though they hate change, they're drawn to chaos because it was their normal. So they hate change, but they're going through change all the time. So they can't get out of that. The next one is they hate change, and so they decide to become a control freak. They're going to have a very rigid routine. Everything's going to have rules. Everything's black and white. It is very strict. They are not going to go through change again. They're going to control everything. Everything has to be predictable. So that is the other extreme. Now, what happens for some is they hate change, and they realize, like that little child, I need a routine. I need structure in order to be safe. So they start to build routine and structure. But they came out of chaos, and they find routine and structure to be boring. It just like, wow, this feels like being in prison. This just, I don't like this. And so without realizing it, they hate change. They want consistency. They find consistency boring, so they drift back to chaos with lots of change. But let's say again, what happens inside of you when, when fear of change is triggered? It triggers a whole bunch of other emotions. So let me start with it triggers other fears inside of you. Fear of the unknown, because I'm going into a change, but there's some stuff in here I've never encountered before, unknown. And so fear that I'm going to get hurt, fear of failure, fear of asking for help. And so all of those fears get triggered. So it's like, it's not just fear of change, it's just fear starts to build inside of you. But then another emotion that many go through is anger. They don't like change. They don't like things being different. They don't like not having known what was going to be happening. And they start getting angry and their irritability is, is there all the time now. Others, they get increased anxiety. So they just feel kind of... Not, anxiety constantly inside of them. Others, when there's a change, they find that a lot of their insecurities come back. And so they feel more insecure when they're around new people that they haven't met before. And then 
What I want you to see is all of those emotions you can't immediately resolve. Because it takes time for your brain to sort out, catalog everything about this new change. And so it means you're going to have to sit in those uncomfortable emotions for a little while while your brain begins to sort it out, look for patterns, make sure things are safe, etc. There's some other emotions. Some people feel guilt when they're change, when they go through change because over here you used to have all of these people in your life, you used to do all these activities. When you change, that means some activities get dropped, that means some people get dropped, and you feel guilty that you might have offended somebody, that you might have let somebody down. So change can trigger guilt. Other people, when they go through change, they feel so overwhelmed by all the new that they become paralyzed. They, they just can't make decisions. That's how fear just kind of brings them to a point of paralysis. And then some people, when they go through change, they feel a certain loss of control. They don't know where everything's at. They don't know what to expect. And that loss of control is, is not a pleasant feeling. But think of loss of control this way. Somebody has said, when we choose to create a change, such as moving to a new home or shifting jobs, we feel more in control because we initiated it. That was our decision. But if the change is brought about by forces outside of our control, whether a boss, a pandemic, an accident, accident we feel disempowered. We feel more out of control and it makes it even harder. And so for some people, when they go through change and they feel overwhelmed and the fear is building and they feel a loss of control, they can quickly go to hopelessness. This is too much. I can't handle it. What's the point? So then what happens? All of those emotions are going on inside of you and those are a lot of powerful emotions. Or another way to say that is your limbic brain is very fired up by all of the things that are happening in the change. So some people, they respond to all of that by sabotaging. Oh, I'm not going to move. I'm not going to take this job. And they start sabotaging. I can't start this new relationship. It's too much change. I'm going to sabotage. So basically what they say, I'm going to go back to the way things were. Even though the way things were, were crappy, even though the way things were, I was getting hurt, Change creates so much fear and insecurity, I'll sabotage it and go back to what feels normal, even though it's bad. Some, when they go through into a change, they become super controlling, super rigid. They become less patient with people, more demanding of people. Everybody now has to do everything perfectly or they get mad at people. And so their expectations become quite unrealistic they become very demanding. And then for others, their bubble gets bigger. So it's like, I am going through a change. All my energy right now is trying to adjust to this change. I don't have energy to connect with anybody. So I don't want relationships right now. I don't want to have to deal with people or relationship issues. So my bubble is big. Get out of my life. Other people, when they go through change, they become super needy. Their bubble gets smaller. And all of a sudden, this is too much. I'm feeling overwhelmed. Will you help me? Will you help me? Will you help me? And they just feel very much like an infant again, helpless to do anything for themselves. And so all of those things can be behaviors that get triggered by the fear of change. Others, when they're going through a change... Fear kicks in, I don't want this change, so what is my response? I will find everything wrong with this change. I will get super negative about everything about this change. I am looking for a way to justify sabotaging this change. Others, when they are looking at a change that they need to make, their fear kicks in and all of a sudden they make excuse after excuse why they can't make that change. Why it's just not the right time, it's impossible, they just can't do it, 
and they come up with all kinds of excuses to keep from making that change. Other people, they know they need to make the change. Others are encouraging them to make the change, pushing them to make the change, and they just get super stubborn. They dig in their heels, and it, even though they know academically that this change is good for them, something in them resists it. Something in them gets really stubborn about making that change. And so for some, when they see a possible change, first of all, they get negative, they resist it, and then they try to recruit others who also think the change is a bad idea. And now they have support in saying this change is stupid. We shouldn't make this change. We should stay where we're at. And so another way to say that is some people with the fear of change go to great lengths to not, never make a change, to avoid change, even though it might hurt their relationships, it might hurt them as a person. They just resist it and go to great lengths to not make it. And so for some, they will stay in an unhealthy relationship or in a very unsatisfying, unhealthy job situation. They will stay in that rather than change because the change scares them so much. And then that takes some people to then beat themselves up. I'm so weak, I'm such a loser, I'm so afraid of everything, and they get down on themselves but they still don't change. So how did you do with that? Do you see some of those characteristics in yourself when you are facing a change? So let me just take this in a little different direction now. Think about our world today and what it's like to live in our world today. <clears throat> and think of what it's like for children who have complex trauma. So our world today, um, how it's different mainly from 200 years ago is now we have urbanization. People, the majority of the population of the world lives in cities. Very few people live in villages, in small communities like they did 200 years ago. And what was it like 200 years ago in villages and small communities? You knew everybody. There wasn't a turnover of people. Everything basically remained the same. It was constant, consistent. Well, what is it about urbanization? Well, every day you're meeting people you don't meet. Every time you ride on a bus, you're riding with people you don't know. You're constantly exposed to new environments. Things are changing all the time. New buildings going up. People moving, people leaving, new neighbors coming in. Constant change. And so the children, our children today, are growing up with more changes than any other generation. Change is just happening constantly. And so for a child of complex trauma, that means, that just means their stress system is constantly activated, not just at home, but out in society as well, because of all the changes that are happening. And then another thing that is unique about today is we now are what we call a global village. Because of the news, we know what's happening in every part of the world. We know about every disaster. We know about every war. That didn't happen 200 years ago. But today we are aware of every possible danger all around the world and every change, major change that is taking place in the world. And so change is just grown and grown and grown to very great rates in our culture today. And so I want you to just appreciate the challenges that creates on the stress system of children. So what a child needs is, I can handle the changes of the world if my home life is stable if my mom and dad are my rocks, if they protect, if they care for me, I can handle what's going on out there as long as I got a safe harbor, a refuge. But what about complex trauma? Out there's not safe, in the family is not safe, 
Constant change out there, constant unpredictability in the family, constant stress. And so what a child has to do then to survive is build a great radar system that detects in the home the slightest changes. So I want you to think of two examples, and again, see it through the eyes of your children. So let's say that you've been an addict, and you have kind of stepped away from your children, either not been there physically or definitely not there emotionally, as you've been wrapped up in your addiction. And so your child experienced all kinds of pain from that because you were not emotionally available, because you weren't giving them unconditional love. All of the things, their stress system was activated. They experienced hurt, abandonment, rejection, all kinds of different fears. As they saw you go worse and worse, their fear increased. So all of that is happening. Now you're in recovery. To the child, the worst thing that can happen to them now is that mom and dad relapse. If they relapse, they'll lose them again. It'll go through all the hurt again, the abandonment again. And they just do not want to go there. So they feel a certain amount of responsibility to help you stay clean and sober. And so they develop a radar system that detects over hundreds and hundreds of little parts of who you are the slightest little change. So they pay close attention to does mom wear makeup every day? No, mom ma wears makeup only when she goes out. Okay, that's the normal. What's mom's mood like every day? Is it fairly consistent? Yes, it is. She's quite regulated. Okay, who does mom talk to every day? What does she devote her time to every day? What does, what's her vocabulary? What kind of language does she use? So they have all that sorted out. They have their radar set to monitor all of those things about you. So what happens that one day, all of a sudden you're going out, but you don't put your makeup on. They're going, okay, something changed. What's that all about? Or all of a sudden one day you're a lot moodier than you've been for months and months. Or you now start using a lot of swear words in your language and you don't normally do that. Change. Child's radar is going, danger, danger, something's off, something's off. What's happening here? And it activates their stress system. And they are starting to panic. Because to them, they are seeing that these changes are not good changes and they could lead to a relapse. And so a child's radar is actually detecting the beginning of the dominoes falling that will eventually result in a relapse. And they probably know your early warning signs even better than you are, you do, that you're heading to a relapse. That's because they long for stability, security, safety. And you are the person they're looking to to provide that. And so their radar detects if you're safe, stable, and consistent. So that becomes a very important thing to be aware of is the fear of getting hurt has led the child to be hypersensitive to the smallest changes in you and its environment. And they have a hyper radar. Let me give you another example. Let's say that you're single parenting right now and so your parent, your, your children have your time, your focus, your energy, and they know what to expect when you get home from work. Life is fairly consistent. And then all of a sudden, you decide you're going to start dating again. And you, bring, you have a girlfriend or boyfriend. What is going on in a child from complex trauma? All of a sudden, they notice a change. Dad is not spending as much time with me. Dad seems more interested in this other person than he is in me. Does that mean that dad might drop me? That I don't really matter to dad? Fear. That little change in dad's behavior has triggered a deep fear 
of abandonment, of not mattering to dad. And that can be significant. And then what some dads do is they want to bring the girlfriend to meet the kids after a while. And the kids have never met this person before. They've just heard dad talking to her and about her. And so this is their first meeting. And dad's all excited for the kids to meet this girlfriend. And and he wants the kids to just kind of embrace this person, welcome them into their heart, and, and have this close intimacy that he has with his girlfriend. And the kids are going, whoa, wait a minute. You've had weeks and months to get to know this person. This is our first meeting. Don't expect us to have the same connection that you have. Don't try to push us to have a small bubble with this person. We don't know if they're safe. We don't know anything about them by firsthand experience. And so they pull away. All because change and the fear that goes with that has been triggered. And so what they found, and I listened to somebody talk about a study that was done, that one of the things that activates the child's stress response system is when mom or dad starts dating. And all of a sudden, the child is kind of at a heightened activation of saying, "Uh uh-oh, change is happening. Is this going to be good? Is this going to be bad? And then they don't want to get pressured into anything because they are going through all kinds of stuff internally. So having said all of that, let's come to how do we heal in this area? Fear of change can cause you to do a whole bunch of unhealthy things in response to it. Sabotage, become negative, resist stubbornly, all of those things that can really hurt relationships, yourself, jobs, etc. So what do we need to do? So first of all, grow in self-awareness. When you go through a change, the next time you go through a change, pay attention to what gets triggered inside of you. What are your natural thoughts that come? What kind of behaviors want to start acting out whenever you go through a change. So start becoming self-aware of how change affects you. And then what you need to understand is change triggers your limbic brain. And so the goal of recovery is to have my cortex running the show and not my limbic brain because it's not a reliable guide. And so understand then that I have to keep working on figuring out how to de-escalate my limbic brain, get back into my cortex, process through stuff in a wise, healthy way, and not just react out of the limbic emotional center. All of that becomes so important. One of the things that's just very practical advice for people who are facing a change is to think about possible scenarios about how that change might affect you. Okay, I'm moving to a new city. I think this is, I might go through some of these emotions. I might go through some of these temptations. So how am I going to prepare for that? What will I do when I get there? And that that temptation kicks in. How am I going to respond to that? And so you're preparing yourself in advance for possible scenarios that you might encounter when you go through a change. And then train yourself to sit in the discomfort of the emotions of change while your brain figures everything out slowly. Don't be afraid to talk to somebody when you're going through a time of change. Don't be afraid to ask for help. If you're finding lots of things are getting triggered and you're starting to feel overwhelmed and paralyzed. And then when you're going through change, you still need a rock at the center. You still need to be able to connect to something stable, secure, consistent, reliable. That could be your higher power. That could be another person. But you need that secure connection internally. And then I think the best way to end this is just the famous serenity prayer to... Have the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, 
the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Okay, that's the end of part one. We're going to take a short break, and I'm going to come back for the Christian part. If that doesn't interest you, not a problem. You're free to go. To everybody else, I'll be back in just a minute. Well, welcome back. We started a look at the life of Joseph, a character in the Bible who became famous for rescuing Israel at a time of famine throughout the world. And we've been looking at kind of his dysfunctional family. Today we're going to come to his main trauma. And then I, I need to say up front that what jo- Joseph is going to go through what we're going to look at today may trigger some of you because it's pretty painful, intense stuff. What we saw last week is that Joseph was a favored kid. He had 10 older brothers. His dad favored him over everybody else and gave him special treatment. He didn't have to work as hard. And as a result, his 10 older brothers hated him. And we're told that Every time they were with him, they said unkind words to him. They bullied him. They took shots. They were cruel. And so Joseph grew up in a family environment where his brothers were constantly being abusive, disrespectful. Dad didn't do anything about it. And it was just an awful existence. And then to make it worse, Joseph had some dreams. And and in the dreams, he dreamt that he was going to be above his brothers one day and they were going to bow down to him. And he thought if he shared those dreams with his brothers that they would come to see that it was right for dad to be treating him as the favorite child. But sharing those dreams with his brothers just caused his brothers to hate him all the more. And so there was just an intense hatred that the brothers had towards Joseph. And so now today we come to kind of the explosion that takes place from all of that hatred in the brothers. And so we're told told this in Genesis 37. Joseph's brothers, so Joseph is 17 years old, and in a very dry country, um, they they were shepherds, and so you moved all the time with the sheep to try to find grassy areas. So the brothers went to a pasture at Shechem, which is quite a ways away. And when they had been gone for some time, Jacob, that's Joseph's father, said to Joseph, your brothers are pasturing their sheep at Shechem. Get ready and I will send you to them. So Joseph hasn't had to work. He's been at home, favored child. But dad wants him to go and check because he hasn't got any reports on how things are going. And he knows that Shechem is where one of the, their sister Dinah got raped and, and then two of the brothers went and killed all the men in Shechem. So he's just concerned there might be some problems and, and he's a little concerned that he hasn't heard anything. So he sends Joseph just to check up that everything's okay. And so Joseph's brothers see Joseph coming. Probably they saw that special coat that he was wearing. So they recognize him at the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. That's how deep the hatred had become. And so they said, you know what? We're sick of dealing with this spoiled kid. Let's get rid of him. Here's our opportunity. And we can say to dad that he got killed by a wild animal or something. But here's our chance. We're away from everybody. Dad's not here. Let's kill him. So that is the plan. So here comes the dreamer, they said, when Joseph finally gets in earshot. Come, let's kill him. Throw him into one of these sisters. We can tell our father a wild animal's eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. 
So you imagine Joseph's hearing his brothers saying this, they're planning to kill him, and he's just full of fear. And then Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain by killing our brother? He's a little bit, he's not quite ready to go there. We'd have to cover up the crime instead of hurting him. Let's sell him. And so they were taking care of their sheep on a major trading route that went from Egypt up into what we would know today as Israel, Jordan, Iraq, all of those countries. So that was where they were. So they saw traders going along this road all the time. So Judah says, let's sell them to those Ishmaelite tra traders. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So when the Ishmaelites who were traders came by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of a cistern and sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver. And the traders took him to Egypt. Now I want you just to think about that. There are so many separate traumas, big T traumas in that. So the first is, here's a child, 17-year-old kid who's been spoiled, going to now be a slave because that's what the Ishmaelites were going to do, sell him in Egypt as a slave. So he was going to be treated as a slave, mistreated. He was going to get to Egypt, be stripped, paraded naked, hit, whipped, all of that. No justice would be done. It would be a total change of lifestyle. It would be going from favor to mistreatment to injustice to being looked down upon. That in and of itself, is just a mind-boggling thing for a 17-year-old to take in. And the pain of all of that. But more than that, he's going to a foreign country. He doesn't know the language. He doesn't know the customs. People have a little different skin color. He's now a minority. He, it's, that's another change that's massive. How do you survive all alone in a foreign country, not knowing the language? That was a big thing. But then he's processing how his brothers have treated him. They have just vented their hatred. Now he sees the depth of their hatred. They were talking about killing him. But rather they've sold him. They've gotten rid of him. They've sent him away. They don't care about how hard it's going to be for them, for him. They don't care about how hurt he feels. They don't care that he's going through major feelings of rejection and abandonment and being all alone. Can you imagine all of that, what that would have brought up inside of Joseph? It would have been just powerful, powerful, intense, painful emotions. But then it would be tons of confusion. What's going on here? This wasn't supposed to happen. I, I was just going about my day, helping dad out. This was supposed to be an easy trip. Now I'm on my way to Egypt. Now I'm going to be a slave. Fear, worry, confusion. And then thinking, what's dad going to feel when the brothers go back and I'm not there? When I don't return home and the brothers say that a wild animal killed me. How's that going to affect my dad? I love my dad. It's going to destroy him. I'm his favorite child. And now he's got to process through all of that. And then he's going to have all of this anger rise up against his brothers, wishing he could get even, wishing he could make them pay, wishing he could punish them for what they've done. And then he's got worry about, okay, what's going to happen next? Who's going to buy me as a slave? How will I be treated? Will I be put into forced, hard, manual labor? Will I be a sexual slave? What, what will be, happen to me? All kinds of worry. But then I think there might have been a spiritual crisis too. Where's God? God gave me a dream that I was supposed to become great. But I'm going to be a slave in a foreign country. Can I trust God? Does God even exist? What do I do with this whole God stuff that my parents and grandparents have told me about? It would have been a, a spiritual crisis big time. 
And so I hope you begin to realize is that this was major trauma for Joseph. This had wrapped up in this one event. Huge losses, huge pain, huge fears, many, many painful emotions. And many of you have gone through stuff. Do you want to know what I find amazing about Joseph? I believe Joseph probably went through a, a, a time of deep depression, sadness, confusion, doubt. He didn't know what to make of all of this. He, part of him probably wanted just to remain angry. Part of him wanted to shut down. Part of him wanted to just rebel and, and lash out, not care about anything. But what we see when the next time we meet Joseph is he's still following God. He still is trusting God. He's still wanting to do life by God's healthy design. Absolutely mind-boggling how in the midst of his world falling apart, he still found that he trusted God. And that becomes the beauty of Joseph. And it helps us as we look at our own pain and trauma that for many people, a central piece in the healing journey is realizing God didn't cause all of that stuff to happen. That's not what God's about. But in the middle of what others have done to me and all the injustice and all the pain, I can still reach out and trust God. He'll be there to help. And Joseph did. Let's pray. Father, what Joseph has gone through is not foreign to what many listening to me today have gone through in their own lives. And I just pray that his example, his life, his relationship with you would provide some comfort, provide some guidance to people as they seek to heal and grow and deal with their own traumas. Amen. Well, that's the end of another Friday night. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you have a great weekend. We'll see you next Friday.